Thank you, Worshipful Marty. Good evening, brethren, and uh, welcome to Burlingham Lodge number 400's monthly Masonic guest speaker presentation. This is now our sixth speaker in our speaker series. My name is Roberto Diaz Jr. and I am the Worshipful Master Burlingham Lodge number 400 in Burlingham, California. On behalf of our lodge, I would like to offer a great big fraternal welcome to all. We're very pleased to have you here again with us. Uh, before we start, Worshipful Marty, yeah, could you lead us in prayer, please? Sure, I'd be happy to. Brethren, if you would kindly assume an, an attitude of prayer with me. God and Lord of all time, past, present, and future, teach us the importance of rationing our time through the use of the 24-inch gauge so that we may do the really important things in life. Remind us about the reality of time represented by the level so that we'll spend time wisely since we live in the shadow of eternity. Show us from the hourglass that time is relentless so that each moment is precious and never to be squandered. Enable us to learn from the scythe the restraints of time and not procrastinate thus to do our duty before the cutting and destructive effects of time marks us as part of its harvest of men's lives. Grant us the wisdom to use our time with care and skill as we gather here today. Amen. So more be. Thank you, Worshipful Marty. Brethren, I have to apologize if there's some background noise on my end. Um, I'm presently in Puerto Rico uh, visiting my, uh, my parents and uh, there's a neighbor's dog in the background. There's a native tree frog that I have definitely no control of. And I think they're in mating season right now. So I apologize beforehand. Um, brethren, please uh, join, uh, join us in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of our country. And I'm gonna ask our junior warden brother, Barry Kopp, if uh, you could lead us. Um, brethren, please remain silent and uh, just repeat after him silently and he'll lead us. Brother Barry. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, brother. Uh, helping us tonight, we have, uh, as you already know, our worshipful brother Marty Cousy, uh, past master of Burlingame 400. We have also worshipful David Jolliffe, our secretary, also past master of Burlingame. Uh, we have brother Barry Kopp, our junior warden. Uh, so without further ado, brethren, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our uh, lecture to new to our lecture series, uh, worshipful Carlos Manuel Diaz Jr., past master. As you notice, he is Diaz, I am Diaz. Very different, Diaz uh, stands for 10. So I, I think uh, he gets a solid 10 on that one. <laughs> Worshipful Diaz joined Masonry in 2010 and was raised in 2011. In uh, 2016, he served as Worshipful Master of Solomon Staircase Lodge number 357 in Buena Park, uh, which is, uh, I believe, near LA. Um, he has served as a member of and um, co-chair of the Public Schools Advisory Council for the Grand Lodge of California since 2016. He has also served as a member of the uh, Special Committee on Leadership Development regarding uh, officer positions he held uh, for California Grand Lodge. Um, Brother Carlos served as Grand Standard Bearer in 2017 uh, with Most Worshipful Bruce Calloway. Worshipful Diaz was appointed in 2020 as inspector of the 905th Masonic District. Worshipful Brother Carlos will be presenting this evening the Entered Apprentice Tracing Board, lecture on Josiah Bowring's hand-painted image. Worshipful Carlos, the virtual floor is yours. 
Thank you, Worshipful Master, and thank you guys for uh, having me. I really appreciate it, Marty, for asking me here. Um, I've talked at my lodge, obviously, um, you know, Downey, Anaheim, Burbank. I've talked to a lot of lodges, and it's usually on different topics. Um, could be, you know, masonry, spirituality. And this one here, um, you know what, I'm, I'm going to share my screen so you guys can look at this. And um, what I want to share with you, if you haven't seen the picture already, is the uh, tracing board from Josiah Bowring. And Josiah Bowring, he was uh, from the UK. Um, his occupation was a painter from the late 18th century, early 19th century. Um, this is the Entered Apprentice Tracing Board um, and it's well known for being a hand-painted uh, portrait on wood. Um, obviously he's got second and third degree, uh, but he was uh, from 1957, or I'm sorry, 1757 to 1832. Uh, he was 75 years of age. And so, uh, as I mentioned, he was from the UK, his occupation was painter. He was known for doing a lot of landscape painting, but, um, you know, he really put, and if you got if you think of the time, that's one thing that we, we lose sight of when we talk about masonry, whether it's 17th century, 16th, 15th, is how many resources, we have iPads and tablets and the internet and all that, right? But you got to think of how people had resources, books to transfer. And if you look at a painting like this, for him to put this for brethren, uh, you know, it's pretty empowering, but what I'd like to talk to you guys about, and I've, uh, you know, I've really shared this with so many lodges and, and you know, uh, fraternal groups is, you know, this is an image, it's like a novel or a book, it's just an image, but I've always, you know, the artwork that we have in my lodge, and when I visit lodges all the way up in Rica or whatever, I mean, you got to look at some of the ornate artwork that's on these buildings, the paintings, the, um, you know, the, the, the woodcraft that's that's embedded within you know the building or the inside and you got to look at all that as a, a story that's being told you know i've i've since day one been someone who's very very passionate about freemasonry you know uh with my the the, the things that i learn i've come up i've heard a phrase and, I, and i've loved it but with the appetite comes the meal and i'll explain that a little bit more as we get into this it'll probably make more sense but looking at this image here, you know, it's a, it's a lifelong study, just like masonry. It's a lifelong passage. You know, we're not going to learn the first degree obligation and just kind of get it. And we know it, right? Even as doing the memorization as a master, as an officer, you, you pick up things five years later, you know, whatever, whether you're watching a degree or you're reading the cipher and little things just jump out at you. And the same thing happens with these images to really decipher it. We could look at it and be like wisdom, strength, beauty. Yeah, sure. I know that. But as you really delve into what you're looking at, what's being told you, I hope that that's something that you guys, you know, take with you moving forward, uh, no matter what you do with, with your lodge, your studies and all that. So what I'd like to do is, you know, for you guys to look at, uh, uh, we'll start at the bottom, right? And the bottom is the floor, of course, the image, um, but it's a checkered pattern. And it's, it's what it's symbolizing is it's a symbolizing low consciousness, right? If it was one solid color, there wouldn't be any contrast. And one thing that it's doing is it's having that contrast of the black and white, but what it represents is the duality, right? The duality of our first degree when we walk through the West gates, you know, we've come from the corporeal world, we were at work, we drove there and all that. But we enter, when we enter the lodge through those West gates, you know, it's a total different thing. At least you should look at it that way. And that's the duality between, you know, the, the lodge, the realm, the spirituality, your connection with the creator versus the corporeal world, things that we can control, what we do with our time, et cetera. And this duality of, of the checkered floor, left, right, you know, good, bad, uh, light, dark, you know, it's that duality that gives us this contrast. It's that duality that lets us uh, learn. Um, and that's taught in masonry, the inner and the outer nature, male, female, negative and positive. And all that's displayed right here on this image, whether you know it or not, natural law and morality. And this duality is something that not only contrasts to let you know what something is, because you have something opposite of it, just like you would with heat and cold. You know, where does the cold end and the heat start? Where does the love, hate and the, and the you know, the, the love end and the hate start? You know, it's really on the same polarity. It's just a matter of degrees of where it goes, you know? You don't know how dark something is unless you have the lack of light. And so this duality that you should be paying attention to starts at the floor and that's just recognizing that, that alone. Um, and so without that, you wouldn't really realize, okay, there's something going on here. Um, and to realize right from wrong, actually. 
because you know th those who don't know of that, and even looking at this floor, you can imagine it's like a checkered pattern that represents the unaware, the unknown, the uninitiated, those who don't realize that there's a right and a wrong. And that's why it's the low level, it's the floor level. Mm -hmm. And those who, and, and also if somebody's ignorant or somebody doesn't really uh, catch something, you know, they can be played, played like chess pieces on a board. If you can look at that metaphor there, right? Versus those who are wise and knowing, they could see these things coming and actually pivot and maneuver themselves to benefit moves that are coming rather than being played. So if you look at the floor level, those being unaware, the duality, knowing that there's something outside of us, something different than just being born, living, and then dying, right? Um, one thing that's not shown on here, and usually you see this in European artwork, like in Germany, I believe. I couldn't find one, but I did find one earlier today. And um, let me see here. I'm gonna see if I can pull it up here. And what it usually has is you have the ground floor, just like, uh, can you guys see the second image right now? Actually, hold on, no, you can't, it's right here. Here it is. Let's hide this panel and share. And so this is what I was referring to where in Germany, I think during some of their degrees and some of the European paintings, you have the same thing we're looking at, right? Where you have the columns, the checkered floor, all that, the tools, but below that sometimes illustrated is sometimes just a grave. This shows more of a, like the earth and a grave, but that's basically something that's below the unconscious, below the uninitiated, below those who are just cognizant to what's going on. So you have the floor level of those, you know, who are just finding out that there's something more than just them. And below that, sometimes it's illustrated as a grave. Basically those who are sleeping, those who are just unaware of what's, what's accessible to them and what they have access to. So let me raise this, so I can go back to this one. And so that's something that just kind of tells you, you know, the, 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 the pattern of the lessons that can be learned. And they're stuck in the material ego self, those who are below that. Um, the columns, obviously the left is strength, masculine pillar, right? The Doric, it's representing serenity, solar, positive, action. And above that is the sun. Uh, and at the base of that column is the level. And that's actions must be in balance, right? To be level. And that's the same symbol as the senior warden, obviously, strength. Above the column is the sun for light, positive, the left side of the brain, which performs tasks that have to do with logic, such as uh, you know, science, mathematics. And the column on the right is beauty, you know, represents the feminine pillar, the Corinthian, uh, representing emotion, dark, polarity, negative, right side of the brain, which performs tasks that have to do with creativity and the arts. So right there alone, I mean, let's just backtrack to what I was just talking about, the duality, right? We're talking about left, right, positive, negative, male, female, uh, lunar, sun, right? This is always in, con in, in, in constant display. You have that duality there that we, that we just talked about. It's right there in front of you again for you to, to recognize. Um, and above that is the moon, obviously, with seven stars around it. And this is kind of like one of the hidden gems that I like about Masonic paintings and artwork is, okay, why seven? And we'll get into that. But little things like that, right? Um, look at every little detail that's being told to you. You know, seven, what does it represent? Um, so the moon is always associated with lunar feminine energy. Uh, again, it's, it's shown right here too. And the plum, is, the plum is leaning up against that feminine pillar right, to symbolizing to, to govern our emotions and to keep our emotions upright. Um, and the same symbol as a junior warden, of course. So we have each of these, these two principles, all of us, whether you use it, you utilize it, you recognize it, you study it or not, you have it. We all have that. Um, and that's one of the great things with not only masonry, but with uh, spiritual teachings, which I'm really heavy into, is you can't be the conduit and the plug at the same time. You're either one or the other. And so that could deal with you're either learning or you're bestowing, right? The only thing that bestows constantly is the creator. Has everything it needs, everything that we know and have and want, it has. That's the only thing that bestows all the time. For us, though, we go through these patterns left and right of bestowing and learning, uh, bestowing and learning. And so you see that we each have each of these dual um, characteristics and things and these principles, right? So that's within us. But in the center column, now that's the wisdom, 
And that includes both. And you have to have the strength, you have to have the beauty, you have to have the lunar and the, and the sun, you have to have the, the feminine and the male, you have to have both of that to really have it all coincide into the center, right? 50-50, right? In between to have that, to have that wisdom. And this is the way to enlightenment. So it represents thought, creation, right? Things outside our corporeal, just physical, material world, not egoistic. It's the creation, the synthesis of the two. And this is the ionic pillar, right? And this has the combination of the two columns as well. Look at that as well. You have the plane, you have the very enriched one, but now this has a combination of both, the same way it had a combination of the dual uh, characteristics. Um, two sides, uh, both principles, right? So this has got the square pointing up to the base, symbolizing our beast consciousness, again, our corporealness, uh, moving towards morality. And the same symbol of the master, of course, we know that. And in the center above the column is the third eye. Uh, it's illuminated, um, you know, which can only be accomplished by having balance of the right and the left, the sun, the moon, and having that wisdom. And obviously we all in the chairs, we go through both of those first two before we get to the third in order to have the information that we need and the, the wisdom to collectively be enlightened. And in the center of the column above that is the third eye. So it has nothing to do with the solar and the sun, but now this is the all seeing eye, right? The all seeing eye, the wisdom in the column is the ionic pillar uh, with the all seeing eye. So the ionic, the ionit, a little bit of Masonic wordplay there, but you see how those two coincide. And the material of the square level and the plum, look at that. Again, notice these little details. Is it copper? Is it wood? Is it bronze? No, it's the finest metal it can be, it's gold, right? Finest. And what this is referring to now, again, little messages is talking about alchemy. Alchemy is taught in masonry, alchemy is taught in the Kabbalah, alchemy is taught in a lot of things. And the alchemy is obviously the transformation, taking the basic metals and transforming them into gold. So these symbols here are of the highest quality. And that alchemy is what we do from converting and transforming from being you know, the, the neophyte, not knowing, to the enlightened one. That's alchemy, that's transformation. That's something that we've all experienced. Uh, different levels, but we've all done it because we've crossed the threshold of becoming a Mason. And if you look at the ladder in the center, you know, the rungs on the ladder, it, it, it declares wisdom. Uh, and you could look at this from so many different um, perspectives, whether it's Kabbalistic, and if you're looking at the, uh, the rungs, the, um, the rungs of the ladders have to do with the degrees um, and I want to say it's 512, but each 512 represents something, the degrees of advancing. So you could look at it that way. But if you're religious and you're, you're you know, a Christian, okay, you can look at it that way too. And that's the beauty of what a lot of masonry does is it doesn't promote or discredit any religion. It applies, and in those who are members of the Scottish Rite, you're familiar with this, but it applies to whatever your faith is. Any divine faith or study that you've had this can apply to it. So if you look at it right here and you look at you know, the, the ladder and what it represents and the 512 degrees or the 512 rungs that is taught, then great, it makes sense on that standpoint. But if you're more religious and Christian, great, let's talk about Jacob's ladder. You know, it doesn't matter how you slice this up. It, it can appeal to you and it can, it can relate with you. And, and once you become wise on that level, then you really, in my opinion, you don't, you don't you don't dissect things into these little things that we do corporally with politics and religion and my religion is better than you. You look at this and these messages are talking to you. It doesn't matter what your background is. It's going to apply to you. And there's a message that can be learned if you take the time to learn it. And so that's what's so beautiful about this. And you look at this ladder, say, like, okay, well, whatever your divine faith is, you could look at this, interpret things the same way you would in masonry. And the stairs are going from the dark side. Notice that to the, from the night, to the sun, to the light. Again, it's that duality, that contrast from it's going from right to left. It's going from bottom to top. It's going from uh, night to day. All those transitions there. And you see the entered apprentice symbols at the foot of the stairs. And you get the Holy Bible, the square and compass, and you have the two lines that are parallel with the circle in the middle. Um, there's a book that I've read, and I actually pulled it out because I wanted uh, to refer to it in more than one way. And let me make sure you guys can see this. I think I might have, okay, here's the zoom. So hopefully you can see this, and this is called uh, the Kabbalion. It's not with Kabbalah, it's the Kabbalion, and this has to do with the three initiates. Awesome book, 
Um, it does have some references, and I'll put this in the chat afterwards. It does have some minor references to masonry, but it's really more philosophical. If you're just on philosophical, nothing with religion, a great book. But the reason why this is so intense and such a great read um, is because it talks about the three initiates. It has to do with Thoth, the Egyptian god, and um, it has to do with the aspects of self, the three aspects of self. So if we look at this picture and we think of the Kabbalion, and I'll get more into that in a second, you have the three initiatives, the three aspects of self, and this represents the three degrees, inner apprentice, fellow craft, uh, you know, the journeyman, and the master mason at the top of the ladder and all the way through. Um, one other thing that I like to talk about on this ladder is the um, mainly the center. And one thing I didn't get, I'm going to open this up right now, is basically I want to talk to you about chakras, whether you're familiar with it or not. And it's really not chakras itself, but I just want to show you a reference. My computer's running slow because I've got a lot of things open here. Uh, but this will make more sense. Images. And the really interesting thing about all of this is that you see how, and again, I tie this back to, to masonry because I think it's just amazing with regards to how it doesn't necessarily just stick with one thing. It gives you the ability to learn so many different things, which kind of goes back to the message I said earlier, with the appetite comes the meal. I apologize, I didn't have this, I just thought of it right now. I want to open up this. And I will share this. And the reason why I want to share this to you guys is if you look at this and you, look, you think of the ladder that was just there, I'll, I'll toggle back and forth between the two. Take a look at the ladder. And if you notice right in the center, you notice that the woman is wearing the green dress. And let me talk a little bit about the chakras. If you're familiar with that, there's seven chakras. And the woman dressed in the middle, she has the anchor and the key. And no matter which version of this uh, tracing board that you see, you'll notice that that's always the same. But the green, uh, if you look, at, let me explain the chakras real quick. And if you guys are familiar with this, you know, one has got deals with the root, one deals with the uh, sacral, the solar uh, plexus, the heart, throat, third eye, and the crown. And something to keep in mind here is obviously there's seven of them, but each one is designated with a color. And that's just the way it is. The, the one right in the center, if you notice that, of all seven and the right in the center of the body is the heart. And that is green. And so if we go back to the tracing board, you will notice that in this image here, You know, the woman's dress in the green dress, the chakra is the color of the heart. And it's right in the middle. And it's representing love, healing, balance, obviously balance because it's right in the center between the two, left to right, top to bottom. Uh, but the key is dangling from a string, right? It's hanging between the light, dark, up, down, strength, beauty. And the key also represents balance. Um, and this key is to unlock the star or the sun at the gate of the ladder. You need the key in order to become enlightened. Um, but it's dangling like a string, or as you've heard, by a thread. As you know, we've always kind of heard that that phrase: "care is balancing by a thread," or tugging on someone's heartstrings. And look at the analogy. Look at the metaphor here with the key, the string, right in the center. The the green dress representing the dead center, the chakra, the fourth of the seven. It's right in the middle, which is the heart, and the key and the string, all that tied in together. And this is some this is symbolic, right? Uh, and it's what it's doing is it's granting us access to the entrance, it's granting us access to be enlightened, it's granting us access to be elevated. All of this on here. And if you look at this piece, you know, we talked about the seven earlier, uh, and the seven gets, gets brought up so many different ways, and, it, and it's shown on here a few different ways, but, you know, it refers to uh, the secret, uh, if we're all familiar with that, right? It's, it refers to the secret, it refers to the Kabbalion. The seven in reverse and the ladder is connecting the sun to the eye, so it's going backwards, and that's what connects the sun, the eye, and the moon. Uh, stepping from dark to light. And the moon has seven stars. We talked about that earlier. So that's esoteric. 
And the number seven is vast on so many topics of its own in masonry, right? In religion. But, you know, God created earth in seven days. Jesus performed seven miracles, uh, seven days of the week. Solomon built his temple in seven years. The seven chakras we just looked at, right? Whether you're familiar with it or not. Uh, the number seven can be found in nearly every ancient religion no matter which one you, you know, your divine faith is tied to. It can be found in any ancient, ancient religion, even current. And it's the number of completion, the perfection, the creator, right? Both physical and spiritual. And in the, and in the Hermetic teachings, which is the book that I was telling you about earlier, um, you know, it talks about Hermes or Tresmegist, uh, Tres or Thoth, the Egyptian god as we were taught, but the, tr uh, the thrice great, uh, the great, the great, the great, and that's what's dealing with the Kabbalion. But in here, in this book, the Kabbalion, the three initiates, and I'll give you guys the, uh, the title and all that. Um, there's a, um, right at the beginning of the second chapter, and I haven't read this in a while, but I knew where it was at because it always stuck with me, especially when I saw this. But right at the beginning of the seventh chapter for Hermetic Principles, it says, the principles of truth are seven. He who knows these, understandingly, presents, presents the magic key before where, uh, this is small lettering, so I apologize. Um, the magic key before whose touch, all the doors of the temple fly open. So it says the, princi uh, the principles of truth are seven. He who knows these understandingly possesses the magic key before whose touch, all the doors of the temple fly open. And if you read this book, that really touches on so much. But even if you're just to read that, and you come back to this, you talk about the key, you talk about unlocking things, the doors flying open, right? More spiritual mentally than it physically. Uh, you talk about uh, the seven here. Um, it all ties in. And uh, again, this to me has to do with how much you educate yourself. And as we've all heard, you know, the more you put in, the more you get out of it in masonry. Meaning, you know, if you just listen to what's told you and you take that at face value, great. Okay, it's interesting. But the more you delve into your own studies, your own teachings, you know, the other concordant bodies, whatever. And you start putting all these puzzle pieces together, all this really starts hitting you. And when you look at something like this and you put things together like this, that you, you're figuring out, you know, to, to get the key and you go up and then you do the reverse seven, the seven stars, you know, he who possesses the keys, understandingly, all the doors fly open. You would become enlightened. Um, very good book. Um, and just even looking at this, I can see how it all ties in. So this is the most important teaching because it gives uh, you the key to enlightenment. And without that, you know, you really become the neo, you remain the neophyte, I should say. And it gives you a reflection that you need to gain light to transform your life. Uh, I mean, we've always told this to, uh, you know, prospects that there is no one secret in masonry. There is no, you know, the, the one telling virtue or something that we share with one another. If there was, we would all know it, you know, because your aha moments can be different than mine, which tells you that as we all become enlightened and some are more enlightened than the others, um, that's really up to you. And without having this wisdom and this enlightenment as you go through life to figure out what's my life purpose, what is life about? That's something you're gonna answer. It's not gonna be in no internet. It's not gonna be in a book, no religious book. It's not gonna be anywhere. What it is, it's gonna give you some clues for you to piece everything together and for you to reflect. And once you have more of this wisdom, more things to aggregate within yourself, then you have more to reflect upon, which helps you answer your own questions. Uh, the two ashlars, obviously, in the back, separated, equal distance, rough ashlar, which we know about, right? It's, it needs the common gavel and the 24-inch gauge to make it smooth. Uh, the rough ashlar represents someone who has not spent enough time to refine themselves. We know this, right? The 24-inch gauge symbolizing time well employed. Uh, the common gavel is the purification of the heart to make it smooth. The perfect ashlar, uh, uh, you know, it's made smooth, honed, perfect, and upright to create that temple, that one not made with hands. But any stone that is not right angle, that is not perfect, and you stack it and stack it and stack it, by the time you're done, that temple is not going to be upright. It's not going to be right. It's not going to be plumb, right? It takes every single stone to be absolutely perfect. Because as you stack them and as you raise it, and if you look at any old cathedral, right, any one of those stones that are not right and, and perfectly honed and square, it, that temple is going to lean. It's going to be awkward. It's going to be crooked. Right. Again, another metaphor, spiritual, but still it's giving you that information right there to create that perfect temple, that perfect Masonic edifice. And you can't create a straight temple with the rough ashlars. First degree tools presented to you, right? Alchemy, transformation. That's when it's presented to you. And every degree you're giving a tool to proceed with your alchemy, uh, inner self. 
uh, the Lewis is on top of the perfectly honed uh, uh, square. And right, and that's the anchor to rise the stone. If you're familiar with this tool, it's, a, it is common in England, but uh, the Lewis, that's what's used to, to raise a stone. And it, you know, if it's going to get raised, it's going to be not the rough one. It's going to be the perfect one. That's the one that gets raised. Uh, another form of alchemy, right? Raising yourself, transforming your mind from the natural state of being ignorant, if we go back to the floor plan, to being raised to be strong and balanced. Again, balance is one of the things that's uh, shown here. We talked about that with the columns, the up and down, the rough and perfect ashlars uh, aside from each other, and they're not placed next to each other, or they're not um, you know, next to each other in the left or the right, perfectly equally spaced. And if you look at this picture here, obviously the Northeast Southwest is not shown traditionally. It doesn't even have the North, but if you look at the East, that's shown where uh, the master would be at the top, the true East, uh, same as it would be in the lodge. Um, and not only that, but the master is right where the all-seeing eye is, right? Right on top in the east, right in the center. Um, opposite of that is the west is the senior warden in the south. Um, I'm sorry, not opposite of that, but to the right is the senior warden, right? Uh, opposite of that, the north is dark. It doesn't show anything. And then in the west, you have the uh, senior warden uh, opposite of the worshipful master where he typically would be. And so this is a sacred piece of esoteric knowledge, right? It's science. It's available to those who are willing to seek it. Um, and I can reflect on many quotes, um, you know, for me, again, I'll, I'll refer to just some Kabbalistic ones where, you know, uh, as I've heard, you know, he who seeks him shall find him. In other words, if you, you know, bottom line is if you want to find God, you're going to find him. It's not like, God, I hope one of these days I find, no, you're going to find him. Like right now, I don't know where my car keys are. I don't care. I don't need them. I'm not looking for them. I'm not trying to get them to do something. So I'm not going to find them. But if I have to go somewhere and I need to find them, I will find them. That's how certain it is. And so when these phrases come into play, he who seeks shall find him. It's not a question of if you will, you will. It's just a matter of do you want to versus the uninitiated and unknown who has no, no type of desire to, to raise himself, to enlighten himself or to study religion. He's not going to find him. He's not going to find the creator because he has no intent to. Those who do, though, and if uh, the heart is in the right place and that's their true intent, they will. And that to me is what makes sense when I first heard with the appetite comes the meal. And think about this for yourself as a Mason, right? How many people have uh, thought about becoming Masons or look at us like, oh, you're a Mason, right? But just think about that. Obviously, you know, it's not that type of appeal, but I have a, I, I truly feel that we have access to something that a lot of people don't. And this is to enlighten ourselves, whether it's just looking at this painting and staring at it for two hours, literally, and just getting enlightened and getting reflection, right? We have access to something. And that's why I always, I've never taken masonry lightly ever. And the guys in my lodge have always delivered amazing degrees. So to me, when I went through the chairs and all that, if the word was a, I would not say the, like I literally broke it down. If I'm gonna do something, it's gonna be perfect because this is something I have access to and not everybody does. Just think of it on that, on those terms. For example, not everyone has access to college, but if you have access to an Ivy League college, I would hope you appreciate that. And with me, with the appetite comes the meal. If you're yearning and you're thirsty and you're hungry, you have the meal right in front of you. Why are you looking anywhere else? With the appetite comes the meal, eat it. You have access to it. And a lot of people don't. And so you need to cherish this stuff and not just you know, be in the egoistic world of I want something when you get it. You know, you get that new car and then they, four months later, you want another new car because you're tired of this one, right? You get tired of it. You have to appreciate what's in front of you have, and what you have access to and, and build on it because masonry means to be a builder. We build each other. The tracing board is teaching you how to build yourself, how to erect your Masonic edifice. This is giving you the information. Again, you're not going to find it in a book or, or on the internet, right? These are things that we have to look within the Masonic tools uh, artwork, teachings, lessons, uh, charges. We have to listen to what we're being told and watch the degrees, even if it's the 500th one we're watching, you're going to get something out of it, right? So the journey for enlightenment can be achieved by studying these images, studying what we have access to, the words, the esoteric meanings. And that's why I provided that sentence for Marty when he said he wanted to put something on the PDF is that we have to pay attention to the words and the esoteric meaning, the symbology within the degrees, the laws of nature, all things present, uh, because the laws of nature are perfect. Gravity is going to do what gravity does. You cannot negotiate with gravity. It's not going to be any less or more stronger tomorrow than it was today. No one here is going to negotiate with gravity. It's a law of nature. It's fixed. 
its absolute laws of man, well, you know, those are negotiable. Just look at courts, look at judges, look at lawyers. You can have the same law. Somebody's free, somebody goes to jail. How perfect is that? Very imperfect. Everything that man creates is imperfect. Laws of nature are fixed. And the more you align yourself with that, the more things make sense. Whereas if you <laughs> try to align yourself with man-made laws, you're following that bouncing ball and it's always going to be bouncing and you're never going to have a, a solid foundation. That's why to me, corporeal things are whatever you want to make of them, but things that are done by the creator and those laws that are fixed, that's what I study because that's always going to be your handbook. That's never going to waver no matter what happens. Um, again, this is all sacred science, al uh, allegoric uh, information, occult, meaning O-C-C-U-L-T, which means it's, it's not inexistent. It's knowledge that's hidden, which means it will be revealed. It's not going to remain hidden for always. Those who find, you know, those who search, they're going to find it. So with occult messages or occult symbology, that's something that is uh, accessible. There is no secrets. Everything that you don't know is a secret, if you think about it the, on those terms. So literally, um, you know, looking at the first degree tracing board, it's about thought. It's about preserving knowledge. It's about sharing knowledge, enlightening yourself. Again, yourself. It's like golf. You're going to compete against yourself. This, you're going to teach yourself. Of course, it's great to have brothers teach you things, point things out, maybe the same way I'm doing it. Some of this might be uh, remedial. You might be like, I knew all this. Some of you guys might be like, wow, I never looked at this picture, even though I've seen it 500 times. I've never like looked at it from that perspective. And I hope that's what you do get. Um, and that you continue looking at it. And then you find something that I didn't bring up. And you could teach me one day, hey, Carlos, did you notice this? That would be great. Um, it's taught indirectly, just like masonry is. Um, and that's the way it's taught. Um, it does not refer to a single person when we talk about certain things. And again, this, this ties in with religion sometimes. Keep this in mind. It doesn't always tie into a person or a group or a religion or a sect or a, a temple physically in the world. Sometimes it just refers to you and your inner self. So when you hear these words, don't take them literally. Sometimes it might, like Aaron's beard, right? But sometimes other things, they're not a location. It's really trying to tell you something else. Um, in my opinion, it's just a reflection of the universe. Um, that's what I have. And I wouldn't mind taking questions or even if we just do a roundtable discussion. But one thing before I, we do do that, that I'd like to you know, tell you guys about is that if when I first started, if, we, if I were to tell you, hey guys, let's talk about um, Buddhism. Let's talk about chakras, right? You guys would probably be like, oh yeah, yeah, my friend knows about that. Or I've read that book. You'd, you'd have everything predetermined. But just by allowing yourself to listen and look and absorb, you know, whether you know it or not, tonight we have talked about alchemy, Hinduism, allegories, hermeticism or hermetic teachings, however you recognize it, Buddhism, chakras, esoteric, Freemasonry, Judaism, Kabbalah, meditation, occult, philosophy, religion, and spirituality. And if I would have told you we're going to talk about Judaism tonight, <clears throat> you know, you might have predetermined thoughts. You might think of something, but just by allowing yourself and then knowing afterwards what you were told, I hope that gives you a message of what it is that you're capable of absorbing. And when we're in lodge, same, same aspect, you know, what are you capable of absorbing, learning, realizing that you didn't before? Um, I think that's what really just, you know, to me, it's, it's just, you know, it's amazing that every time we go to lodge, we have access to something like that. And hopefully it hits you on that level. Um, uh, but anyways, I'll, I'll take any questions if anybody has any, and I'll definitely put, uh, and I think I even have the podcast for this. So if you guys are the type that commute and you drive, this is amazing just to listen to it. Again, principles, philosophy, things you can't argue. I mean, you really can't argue against it, just like the laws of nature and gravity. You can't argue against that. And when you hear some of the things in this, in this book, it's just, it is very enlightening, you know, whether you want to agree with it or not, at least it kind of slaps you in the face. Like, uh, you know, I, I can't, I can't go against that. That is true, you know, and, and hopefully that opens your mind and other doors tend to fly open within your temple. Worshipful Carlos, thank you so much for that talk. Again, I'll remind the attendees that are joining us uh, this evening that right down below, if you're on a tablet or computer, uh, it could be right at the top of your screen if you're on a phone. Um, you're welcome to send in any Q&As and we'll try to answer them live. Um, Worshipful Carlos, if you don't mind sending me the title and 
uh, author, um, I can send that out to all the attendees that registered today. Um, so then everybody can find that. I can probably even put in a Amazon link if it's available on Amazon. Um, well, yeah. uh, I do have one question, actually two questions that came in so far. Uh, first question was, uh, will this be recorded and will this be shown again later on? Um, everyone that registered will get a link within the next day or two. Um, we post this on our both our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, so you can watch it at any time, share it as well. You can see any of our old recordings. Um, and the very first question is, how has your interpretation of the ladder changed from when you first received your first degree and now that you have many years under your belt, your Masonic study under your belt, uh, how, how did, when you first saw the ladder, uh, see in quotations, uh, and when your eyes were first opened, and how do you see it now? It is, um, it is definitely um, eye-opening, um, not only for Sorry, I was forwarding the um, audio podcast so I could share this with you guys. Uh, but to me, like any of us, you know, we're we're during the first degree. You're kind of like, and of course, we all do our own my minor research and due diligence as far as you know what is Freemasonry, and you try to figure out how much is actually going to happen. But it's it's nothing what I had. I didn't do that much research either. It was nothing like that, and um, so that from day one just kind of blew my hair back, and I figured like, wow, this is. Um, I guess let me back let me backtrack that before that for some reason I was in search for something you could say a mental itch and I didn't know what it was and I was in search of something and the more I got to meet the guys the more I figured you know what I'm going to do this let me find out what happens in these degrees and then I'll figure out if this is for me or not I just knew like this is it like this is something that I was looking for my dad wasn't a mason nobody in my family was a mason so I was the first uh, but to me I just knew like this is what I was looking for and I would share, uh, although that's my story, I, you guys could all relate to this because, you know, I joined when I was 36. So we all joined at different ages. Why don't we all join at 28, 25, 30, 38, you know, right? Why? Because we aren't ready. And again, that's a reflection of whatever you believe in. I'm not going to tell you what to believe in, but that's a reflection of the creator. And he guided each one of us to it when we were ready. He didn't. He didn't put nothing in front of us when we're not ready. He waits till we're ready and then he provides the door in front of us. And I feel that just like anyone else, you were taught, you were brought to Mason, or even if your dad was one, you were brought to join it. I think you were brought to it on your own when you were ready. And so I, I took that to heart and I said, you know, that's why I'm here. This is, this feels natural. This is what I was looking for, whether I knew it or not. The creator brought me here at this time, this point in time in my life you know, rolled with it. And the more I learned and learned, the more it just felt like, you know, I still learn. And, and I know that I'm not there where I want to be, but to me, it's still just an amazing journey. And I have, I mean, I have tons of books here in front of me with, uh, you know, religion, Hinduism, Kabbalah. Um, you know, I was raised a Catholic, so I have a lot of that still in the back of my mind. And when you start piecing all these things together, you really start looking at, uh, I mean, like Noah's Ark, uh, I'm not going to say what I think is true and what you think is not, but when you put these things together and you look at these stories, nothing to do with the boat, right? Nothing to do with water, but it really just floors you with these interpretations. And again, who's to say that they're right or wrong, but you just take these interpretations and now it gives you something more to chew on. Uh, Worshipful Carlos, uh, kind of going in that same vein, and um, I, I didn't realize that you became a Mason um, almost 10 years ago. So congratulations. Uh, you're almost hitting your, your 10 year mark, almost <laughs> exactly one year before me. Um, but here's yeah. one for you. Uh, what have you found? And this kind of goes into what you came into masonry as uh, you saying that you are, um, you're a Catholic. So uh, what have you found in your studies as a Mason that scared you about yourself or caused you to question your beliefs? Um, you know, I think before I joined Masonry, I had more questions and answers about religion. I know, you know, um, so having that religious upbringing is great, 
Um, I questioned a lot of it, not to the fact where I just discredited it. Like, oh, I'm walking away. It was garbage. But I had a lot of questions. Um, you know, my son has gone, he, you know, he attends uh, Servite here in Anaheim, you know, great school, right? Boys prep school, Catholic. Um, and so I have nothing against religion, right? So, but to me, it didn't answer questions. And religion is, if I can, <laughs> please take this with a grain of salt, however you practice your faith, but religion teaches you things has books has stories has thoughts has principles and you have nothing to back check it against and it's kind of one of those things where how do i know if it's right well you'll know when you're dead okay that's not that's not very you know where's the guarantee and not to say that that's the black and white truth of it it's not but to me that's the way i look at it. i, I want to find the root to everything i mean literally the root whereas kabbalah the, what turned me on about that was you're talking about sages or Kabbalists, however you like to look at it, is, is a Kabbalist who has gone to the threshold called a Maksam and come back. Or like a, a, like a Dalai Lama, right? They, they've reached the enlightenment, not physically, but they've reached, they've reached that point of nirvana and come back. And they know it. They know what it feels like. They know what it is. And so what the sages say is, I've been there. I'm going to tell you about it. Do not believe a word I say. Don't believe a word I say because there's science. I'm going to tell you what I did. You do it. If you don't do it, then you don't do it. If you do it, you'll see what I'm saying is right. Then believe me. Till then, don't believe a word I'm saying. That's the exact opposite of Western religion, which tells you this is what it is. Believe it. I went more the other route of, wow, this is great. Okay, cool. Like a scientist that did this, this, and the, poof, something happened in the, in the lab. That's what Kabbalah says. It's a sign. You do this. You go to that path. You learn this, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Otherwise, don't believe a word I'm saying. And so that is what attracted me to it. Now, here I am in masonry, here I am studying, you know, Kabbalah and thinking I'm studying all these little different things. And then I joined uh, the Scottish Rite and come to find out the fourth, 14th and 30th degree are talking about Kabbalah. It blew my mind. I was like, wait a minute. I thought I was doing all these separate things. And this kind of goes back to what I said earlier. When you realize that the more you learn, you realize that all these cogwheels are all connected. There is no separation. So whether you think about, you know, your you, your friend, your family, your, your, your loved ones, the uh, masonry versus religion, all the different religions, it's all connected. And it really just, again, if you kind of think back of our forefathers or even before then, this is why masonry, in my opinion, has always had just kind of a, a very, very dark history, or that's why it went underground, or that's why I had to go dark, because you got men of different backgrounds coming and talking, connecting, debating, everything's open open to thought, open to consideration, open to maybe I'll believe you. It's not just like nowadays, so polar, you know, and the more you become enlightened, the more it's kind of like everything that you, that we're all getting so ramped up about. I'm not gonna say it doesn't, but I mean, come on, everything's connected. Why, why get in religious wars when you, when you really understand everything, everything is, there's a synergy to it. And when you have Masons that would do this, how much of a threat is that to kingdoms, to religions, to, you know, that's why it wasn't because we were cool and we had to go underground for trendy reasons. No, people's lives were at stake because Masons, we were getting together and being very enlightened and open-minded and open to whatever and sharing these things. And, and the more you do that, the more you, just, me personally, I just, I'm very just like calm. Like, I don't, I don't think I know everything. Don't get me wrong. I don't know everything, but I don't get worked up over things where I look at it through a different lens and I'm going to see things. I'm going to be like, I don't, I don't see it. That's what it is. Although whatever the news is telling you, then you know, you're free to believe that if you'd like, but I approach everything with the, the more I've learned in Masonry since 2010 till now, I approach things so much differently as far as I approach my brother to, a, you know, meeting you guys, to my family, to a stranger, to anyone. I have a different temper to it. Thank you for that, Worshipful. Um, thank you for sharing your, your story on that part. Uh, we do have another question from our own Worshipful, and I'll add them on here. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Worshipful Carlos. Uh, very insightful presentation, really enjoyed it. Made me uh, go back and even think about college and all that. Um, it, it's interesting, I've always said, the biggest regret I have of joining Masonry is not having joined much earlier, years back. But what you say just, you know, just hits home. You join at the right time in your life, in your situation, um, in search, when you're in search of something else. 
Um, right. Joining earlier probably would have not been as productive, I think, as when I did. So yes, it would have been, I, I think it would have been fun joining earlier, but who knows the mindset or I had back then, if I was ready work-wise, uh, my right. situation in life, my, you know, it just, I joined at the right time, I think in, in my individual situation. And I, I guess that sort of applies to everybody. I mean, I, I see members joining when they're young and not sure what they're getting of it. Um, very few stay on and stay active. Um, we've seen members be able to do that, but a majority we lose and we hopefully gain, get them back at some point later in their life. But um, any, any thoughts about that? I mean, yourself, 10 years, that yeah. was the right time for you, I, I, I assume. I mean, it any regrets was. on, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I share the same sentiment. I wish I would have learned it earlier. That's pending that I would have absorbed as much as I did when I was 36. Um, and so I think you're totally right. If you would have come across it at 29, would you have grown as much? Would you have taken it as serious as you would have when you did join? And so when, to me, you know, you could see I hold it at a high level. So to me, when someone new walks into our lodge uh, or our library, I should say physically for our building, you know, to me, I'm like, wow, you know, you don't realize what you're about to learn. But I don't say that because I don't want, I don't know how we're all, we all learn different, number one. So number two, I don't know how much he's going to accelerate or how slow he'll learn or how much he'll delve into it. But to me personally, inside, I'm like, wow. You know, you're about to give yourself a gift. Nothing we can give you, but you're about to give yourself a gift and good for you for being in here. And, and as Masons, we can only uh, try to nurture that, 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 you know, that stranger to a friend, to a brother. And uh, like what you said earlier, I would say you're right. Um, to, to what degree do, do the, uh, you know, the new prospects grow? That's some, some of that is on them, but some of that is on us as a lodge to, guide them and direct them and give them just enough to let them know there's a lot in front of you if you're willing to um, apply yourself, but the rest they have to figure out. And, um, you know, not just be, I guess, not for us to be so secretive, like, oh, no, no, when you join, we'll tell you. But you, I, I try to educate the, these guys as much as I can so that they, when they say I want an application, they've made an educated decision. And we've told them as much as we can. And, um, you know, just rely on that. Um, but I think you, uh, I think you and everyone else has joined when they were supposed to, and we may not know what that means right now, but you know, I want some point we will, and that's when it'll make sense. Thank you. Worship. Well, one, one more question. Um, I have a little bit of a concrete mind, um, regarding the, um, the entered apprentice, uh, tracing board, the, uh, Ashlers, the rough and the uh, perfect, um, like you mentioned, the uh, Jacob's ladder goes from right to left, but you see the perfect ashler on the right as opposed to transitioning from rough to perfect, mm -hmm. like the ladder. Is, is that on purpose or? I don't know, but when I look at the, uh, at the, in the east, I don't know how your lodge is, but for us in front of the lectern, we do have the imperfect one on the left and the perfect one on the right. And that seems to be the way it's usually shown or presented. So I think that was on purpose, uh, even though it's on the light side, the imperfect and then the perfectly honed is on the lunar and, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, you know, feminine side. So, uh, <laughs> and maybe, you know, we, we need to uh, apply some of our inner, you know, feminine sometimes where, where man is just so against it, right? T testosterone and all that, and we, we, we suppress it. Whereas if we were to allow ourselves to, or access that part of ourselves a little bit more, we might uh, have more sound judgment in things in life, right? So I don't know, maybe that's that's it. To get to that perfect area, you have to have a little bit more of that feminine aspect in you because you have both. But, you know, as men, we're like, no, we have to have, you know, manly man and all that. But uh, so I don't know, but I think it's it's presented the same way I, we usually see it in Lodge. Thank you. And it's in the East. And uh, Worshipful Carlos, I think we have question, um, time for one more sure. question. Um, and then we'll go to close. This question says, uh, I noticed that the ladder goes from the night or the dark side to light, uh, just like you said in your talk. Uh, would you consider that the apex of the ladder should approach the all seeing an eye instead uh, or towards perhaps godliness? I think that part we all get as 
theoretically as a master, right? But in life, you're going to have to have both, in my opinion. And so what it's doing is it's taking you from the base of the floor and of the night to the top and to the sun. Those two right there are complete opposites, right? Left to right, top to bottom, night to day. I think not having it touch the all seeing eye is something that neither one of us can define. And so we can't define what it is, where it's at. And I think that's on purpose. And I, that's the way I interpret it. And I see it that way, that it shouldn't, because that's something that you're going to attain at some point. Um, you know, when you break it down, you know, the creator, God, whatever you like, there's no picture, there's no image, you know, like in religion, there's no bearded man. Nobody knows what God or the creator looks. It's a force is what it is. It's probably not even human. It's just a force. It bestows. That's what the creator is. And so it's hard to uh, define what that is and to say that you could uh, be equal to, it's kind of like religion, right? Uh, to be like him. You're never going to replace him. You're never going to surpass him. But metaphorically in religion, it says to be like him. You're trying to be like him, not equivalent, but you're trying to perfect yourself to be like him. And so I think not having anything touch it and just having it right in the dead center of the top between the two is, in my opinion, I think that's by uh, strategy. I think that's there for a reason. Uh, but that's a great question, you know, but uh, I think that's what it's doing, though. It's just tying you in between the top, bottom, left, right, and from night to day to, to give you both principles. Well, thank you, Worshipful, for answering all these questions. And I did get uh, one more uh, comment from Brother David Parsons said that the imperfect is in the northeast corner as mm. we were all when we first started. So right. great That's comments, brother. Um, with that, yeah, I learned something. Yeah. <laughs> I that, never claim like over. I know it all. I'll share knowledge. You guys share it right back. Awesome. Yeah. I'll turn it back over to our Worshipful Master, uh, Roberto, and uh, right. for our closing comments. And real quick, um, I just, uh, Marty has it in case anyone's wondering, I've given Marty, I don't know if you guys can see what's in the chat room, but I've given, given him the name of the book and I even gave him the Apple podcast link. So the exact same book and it's just, uh, uh, you know, verbatim, you could listen to it. So by all means, you guys get the book, read it. Um, you can get it on Amazon or just listen to it on your podcast. And I hope you get something out of it. Whatever you get, I just hope you stay open-minded and just, you, you will get something out of it. Trust me. Thank you. Thank you again, Worshipful Carlos. Thanks for agreeing to being here with us tonight and appreciate for sharing it. all this information. Really appreciate it. Uh, before we retire this evening, I'd like to give special thanks for uh, all the help and support uh, to our uh, team in the back. Um, of course, uh, Worshipful Brother Marty Cousing, uh, Worshipful Brother David Jolliffe, and uh, Brother Barry Kopp. Thank you, gentlemen, for a job again. Well done. Um, Brethren, before you leave, uh, uh, let's see, I'm sorry. If, as a reminder, tonight's presentation was recorded, will be made available to everyone who registered. Um, the link will be emailed to you directly. Uh, please feel free to share with others. And the recording can also be asked, uh, accessed on Burlingame Lodge's Facebook page. Uh, regarding future presentations, uh, please stay tuned. Um, as soon as um, we have all the details, it will be uh, forwarded um, in the near future uh, with the uh, link uh, to uh, join us. Um, in closing, uh, Brother Marty, Worshipful Marty, uh, can you lead us in prayer, please? Sure, brethren, if you would please kindly um, assume an attitude of prayer. Supreme Grand Master, as we depart this evening back to our homes from this virtual environment, we pray that you be with all the members of our lodges and all those affected by uh, COVID, by financial crisis, by um, everything disturbing this world. We pray that uh, there'll be a brighter future, that we can all climb that ladder and into the light uh, whether our situation be poor or disgusting, that we in our inner selves can feel fully fulfilled. Amen. So brethren, stay well, please stay safe and have a great evening. Good night, my brothers.